name's Erica Donalds. I'm running for Collier County School Board District 3. I'm currently a CPA, controller, and a partner at an investment firm here in town. I've been there for 12 years. I have experience and expertise in the area of budgets, financial statements, cost controls, compliance, and contracts, which I thought all of those are highly transferable skills to the Collier County School Board with the billion dollar budget that they manage and the many contracts that they're looking at all the time as they're uh, being good stewards of taxpayer dollars. Also a parent of three children, three boys, two of which are school age now and have attended Collier County Public Schools. And so I, I, from a parent's perspective, I definitely have an idea of the concerns of parents, also teachers, and those concerns and, and some things that have been expressed to me kind of led me to want to run for school board. What were those concerns? Well, starting with the after-school care program, as you might know, I started Parents Rock about a year ago when we expressed concerns to the school board about after-school care and the changes that were made without parent input. And what we found at the time was that parent input was circumvented in the process. And going forward, as we attended school board meetings and maybe found other issues that we wanted to speak out about, it was a, more of a culture that the public input, <clears throat> excuse me, was not really respected. And a lot of parents felt that way going forward. And what we had though, and what came out of it, was an organization of parents that are now very engaged and very involved in the district's decisions regarding education. And so that was a big positive. Before we started Parents Rock, we didn't have any parents really coming to the school board meetings unless their child was performing, and then they would leave before the business of the meeting took place. And now we have maybe 10 to 20 parents attending these meetings, also going back to the Parents Rock meetings, which are once a month, and letting those parents know what happened at the meeting, what's coming up, and what to be aware of. And so it's somewhat of a PTA on a district level, because not a lot of these education decisions are made at the school level anymore. They're made at the district level. And so it's important that parents are aware of where decisions are made, whether it's at the district or even at the state level, which we're also involved in, and also to empower parents to know how to get involved in in influencing those decisions. And so we know parent involvement is the number one indicator of student success. So as a school board member, I would wanna to continue to build on that in various ways and get parents more involved in what's going on with education. What would your involvement with that group be if you were elected to the school board? Really just someone who attends their meetings, listens and, and try to be kind of a liaison, if you will, to listen to what their concerns are and, and try to impact decisions made in the district related to parent concerns. Um, I, I just want to clarify something. You said you've got, you have three boys who have attended Collier schools. Yes. Do they currently attend Collier schools? One of my children just graduated from Laurel Oak fifth grade and he'll be going to a public school next year, Mason Classical Academy, public charter school, as well as my uh, middle school stu middle student who's going into second grade, also going to be attending the public charter. The charter. So I guess that would bring up the question of charter schools. It, it sounds as though you're in favor of them. I am in favor of them as long as they are uh, run well and are accountable, you know, uh, proper accountability regarding academics and financial management. I think parent choice is a good thing and I was very happy to be involved in bringing a little bit more choice to Collier County with Mason Classical Academy and very proud of what has been done with that school with parents and the community involved and really taking ownership of uh, allowing a different type of education to be here for the parents who choose that for their kids. So, so not your, not only are your sons going to go there, but you were involved in establishing it. Can you yep. describe that? Sure. I've been a volunteer with Mason Classical Academy since the charter was approved in 2012. I was a member of the advisory board and basically just provided kind of the same expertise that I'm offering to the school board from a financial standpoint, budget, and giving that kind of uh, level of business advice, if you will. Uh, now that we have a principal, we have a business manager, they have a registrar, they have paid staff that's kind of taken on those responsibilities. So. Would you continue on some sort of advisory board or in some capacity? Yeah, I would continue, that, you not only as a parent volunteer, because all parents would be uh, in a volunteer capacity as well, but attending the board meetings and, and providing that advisory capacity as well. Do you have any financial uh, connections or uh obligations to this Mason? Account. No, not at all. Um, only the uh, 
many babysitting bills that I've paid to volunteer and, and put time and effort into getting the school up and running, but definitely no financial interest in the school. And no one does who's been involved. It's, it's as far as charters go, there are charter companies, charter management companies that are for profit that manage the not-for-profit charters. In this case, there is no charter management company. It's just a not-for-profit school. So the, the paid staff at the school is limited to like on-site people, the yes, principal, the teachers? Mm -hmm. So in charters, you know, it's been kind of a hot topic in the election, but it's only 1% <laughs> of the county's budget and 2% of the students that, that go to Collier County Schools. And so I try to keep that into perspective for me and my campaign. Uh, the campaign is 2% about charter schools because that's how many students attend them. Mm -hmm. And there are so many issues that I feel that I can contribute to with the budget, and the finances of the school and the best practices related to cost control and proper analysis, proper planning when it comes to finances that I think are much larger issues as we go forward. If you are uh, uh, attending the meetings and, and continuing to sort of uh, be involved with the academy after you were elected, would you feel the board might uh, have a feeling that you're influencing their decisions because you're a school board member? Um, I don't know that that would necessarily be a bad thing to influence decision making. I think all of our interests are the same and that's to have the students perform well academically and have the school run uh, responsibly from a financial perspective. So I think our interests, whether I'm a school board member, a parent of children in the schools, even if it's a, pub, a regular traditional public school, charter school, uh, or an advisory level, all of those interests are aligned and that's to ensure that every school performs well and is serving the students both academically and from a responsibility perspective, financially. I'm sorry to go back to your sons one more time, but since sure. you said you had three, is the third one? He's three years old. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Uh, you've had ample opportunity to watch the superintendent in action then. Um, what kind of a job do you feel she's doing? Well, I think there's things that she's doing very well, and there's things that I feel that, that could be improved on. I'll start with doing well. I think STEM, the programs that she's brought to the district regarding STEM and getting students really excited about those programs, the competitions that she's done and conferences related to STEM, that's a focus of hers that I think she's been very successful in getting everyone on board, including members of the community. And if you watch those videos online and you see the students so excited about those projects, I think that's excellent. Uh, going from Dr. Thompson and his style of communication to Kamala Patton and her style, I think she's done a phenomenal job as well of being out in the community and being uh, accessible and really putting out the, uh, the image that you know, we, are, we want the community to be involved and we want to be a part of the community as a school district. On the other side of that, I feel like that communication is often very one-sided. We have town hall meetings that are extremely scripted. There's not a true dialogue. And I think if you have one or two of those, the public will We'll, we'll put up with it, if you will, but as it continues and, and real questions are not being asked and debate is not allowed in a public forum, it, it starts to hinder the public trust in the process. So I think that that's an area that she could definitely improve on. Uh, also, the budget, uh, she has not presented a balanced budget yet in her tenure here, and nor a plan to achieve a balanced budget. And so I would like to see that as a school board member from a financial perspective, a bit more responsibility and planning when it comes to finances. Did the board act properly in extending, A, extending her contract, and B, the manner in which they went about extending the contract? I, I don't think so in either case. I'm the type of person that likes to get all the information I possibly can before I make a decision. I'm somewhat of a researcher, if you will. And I feel that as a new board coming on, you know, this board is taking away a year of data that could be used to either extend the contract, increase pay, decrease pay, all these accountability measures that are afforded to the board with their employee, the superintendent, are now taken away for the next four years. And I don't think that that's proper governance. The timing of it and the manner in which it was brought up in the meeting, I think, speaks to some of the issues that we've had in the past with some of the kind of surprise issues that come up just before a board meeting or right before school gets out. And I think that kind of goes back to symptoms of the same problem of really respecting the public input and making sure that the public is well aware of what's going on. Have you received financial support from any organizations, and if so, whom? 
not any um, like a political organization or anything like that. Just, uh, I mean, there's some PTA. Just it doesn't any. Not financially, no. My, my support has come from individuals or small businesses. You know, they might give through their business, but. I've been really fortunate. I have over 420 donors to my campaign, and, and the average donation is less than $100. So I think that says a lot about the support from the community and just regular people that are engaged in a school board race and involved in it through their own finances that they could be certainly doing something else with. So I'm very excited about that kind of support that I've received. You mentioned the forums that you've been attending, and I know one question that's come up was is presented in different ways, but it basically says, do you support teaching the Bible in public schools? And it's maybe a thorny issue. Would you like to expound on it some here? Sure. I, I think it's an interesting question. And uh, one forum, I kind of put my paddle sideways and said yes and no, only because, not from a li religious standpoint, because I agree with the way things are now that religion is separate from schools, prayer is voluntary in the clubs and things like that. Um, but as a high school student, I took as an elective a, a Bible history class and really had no Christian or, or religious teaching in it, but just went through the, the Bible times, which I could really relate to as a student at that time, and gave the historical side of the Bible times. And I was very interested in that class. I remember it very well. I learned a lot in the class. And so I don't have a problem with that kind of perspective. Another issue with the Bible, and college professors say this all the time, is as a literary document, uh, college professors will say they hope that their students will read the Bible ahead of being in college because of all the literary elements in it. And in other literature, it refers to so many biblical uh, idioms and things like that. And so it's beneficial for students to read it from a, a literature perspective. I don't have a problem with either one of those things. I, I do have an issue with any type of religion uh, being taught in schools, in public schools. And along those same lines, is there any, is Mason Academy at all uh, have any religious elements or? Uh, no, not no? at all. Okay. It's a, a public school. There are public classical schools all over the country. And Hillsdale College, their academy, which it's modeled after, is a secular school as well, as is Ridgeview Classical, another model school. It's a public charter school in Colorado. None of those have any religious elements to them. Okay. We have three candidates running for this seat. Uh, four. Like four. Okay. Um, what sets you apart from the others? Well, certainly my financial expertise and experience. And it sets me apart not just from those in my district, but in any district running and anyone currently on the board. There hasn't been someone who has that level of financial experience. You know, I know how to delve into a budget and ask every type of question about these expenses to make sure that we've explored the opportunity cost to those expenses and that we have best practices in place to ensure that the money that we're spending is most effective in the classroom. I'll, I'll give a quick example of something that I looked into on something that a teacher told me about a software program that was being renewed for $375,000. And I requested from the district the feedback that they received from the teachers because this software program was already in place, it was a renewal. Uh, how many students did it serve and what other software programs did they look at and compare to that claimed to do the same thing, why did they not choose those programs? And the answer that I got through this, the public records request was that they did not have answers to any of those questions. And this is $375,000, and we have no teacher feedback, we don't know how many students were serving with that program, and we didn't compare it to any other programs. And so that's the type of analysis that I would like to bring throughout the entire budget in my four years in office if I were to be elected. Since you've uh, made the decision to get into this race, have you done any additional uh, exploration into the budget to see what other uh, problems you might? Find? Yeah, I see some, certainly some issues at the administration level and where I see higher percentages of, say, supply costs. And I would, I would want to get down into underneath that level and, and see what is the underlying uh, reason for that. There's a particular department that has three employees and the supply costs for the previous year were $283,000. And it's not salaries, it's not benefits, it's supplies and other miscellaneous. And that's a lot of money for three people. So I would want to definitely take a look at those things that draw concern. The budget book, if you look online, is very high level. And so as much as I've looked into all of that, 
and kind of delved into as much as I could. I, I have a lot of questions that's going to require me to sit with the budget manager and really go through each section of the budget and understand all of the lines. I mean, in my profession, I've been doing budgets for a many number of years, and I have the expenses down to where I can predict them within 0 to 1% each year, unless something you know, huge happens. And if something does happen in the company, I can say, you know what, I know how that's going to affect our budget just from it happening and without having to go into the spreadsheets. And I think that we need someone who has that level of expertise on the board to be able to ask the right questions. You talk about sitting down with the budget manager. Could you elaborate a little bit on how you differentiate your role as a school board member of overseeing the uh, superintendent and having the superintendent do that kind of work? or, or your Sure, and, and I hope that superintendent is doing that kind of work. The, the board really is responsible for uh, approving the budget and hiring a superintendent. And so those two things, I think the budget side of that being a, a large part of the equation and where I can really offer a lot of expertise, I wouldn't feel comfortable just getting that board, the budget book that I've seen online and saying, yes, I'm okay with this budget. I, as a, as a person who would be holding the district accountable for the budget and following it, I would want to understand the underlying pieces of it in order to approve it. Not to say I'm going to say how to spend the budget, or what to do, but I'm going to ask the questions that hopefully will help them to go in the right direction as it comes to following the school board's policies and allow the other school board members to really understand what's going on behind those huge numbers that you see in the budget booklet. So it's not really about me managing the budget, really just understanding it and being able to ask questions and also as part of those duties, holding the superintendent accountable for her management of the budget. A couple of initiatives that are either underway or about to get underway, uh, the Bring Your Own Device. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that is well underway. It is in our child, child school, and we were one of the second, second tier of schools that came on. I went to the BYOD workshops. I did a lot of research on BYOD. I did not approve of it coming into the elementary schools. Really more of a form of opportunity cost and the burden on the teacher, and the teachers are already burdened as it is. Um, so, what happened at that meeting is the Pelican Marsh principal, who was one of the pilot schools, came and said that he had just about 50% participation in BYOD in his school. Now, this is one of the higher income schools, and one of the big concerns about BYOD is the equality, where if not everyone is participating, then you have people sharing devices, you have one with an iPad that's brand new, you have another with a, a device that costs 99 cents signing up for a phone plan, and a teacher that then has to manage the differences between all these devices. In the elementary school level, I think if you have this information that you have only 50% participation in one of the higher income, higher performing schools, I think rolling it out to the remainder of the schools was a mistake so fast. And certainly when you hear from parents that they don't want it in the elementary schools, there should have been a bit more consideration before continuing to roll out the program. Uh, Common Core. I actually got involved in education starting with Common Core and the changes to the curriculum that started when my oldest son was going into third grade. I noticed that the third grade materials were eerily similar to the second grade materials, as did my son, and he was very bored and upset that he had to do the same thing over again. And what the problem was, though, that the answer I got at the local level was that these decisions are made in Tallahassee. So when I have questions about the books that are being used in my child's classroom at the time Veterans Memorial Elementary, I end up talking to our state representative about it, which I thought was a huge issue. And with Common Core, what I found is that decision would then go even further away to Washington, D.C. And I thought, well, who am I going to call then? The congressman? And when I have an issue with uh, materials in my child's classroom? So I, I do have a problem with further taking away local control from our district level. Uh, Florida, of course, is right now under Common Core, renamed to the Florida Sunshine State Standards. We've selected a test. We haven't implemented it yet. We'll see how that goes, but it is a national high-stakes test. The other major issue I have with Common Core, and similar to BYOD, is that it's never been tested anywhere in any district across the country. It's being rolled out to 41 states, and, and that number's coming down, and we haven't seen the results, and we're putting it in our classrooms. And I'm just not the type of person to go on what someone says it's going to do. I'd like to see it work first and then bring it on. 
So there's a couple of issues that I have with Common Core. Of course, as a school board member, I'm going to do as much as I can to ensure that we're selecting the materials that are best for our kids that meet the standards that Florida has set forth. The school grades that came back showed a number of uh, lower grades for Mockley area schools and certain other geographic regions. How would you as a school board member address that? I don't think it's a school board member's job to address that really. That's the superintendent's job and a school board member would A, make sure that the budget is in, in a way that she has the resources that she needs in order to address those issues at those schools and she's doing so in an effective manner. And then holding the superintendent accountable through evaluation process to ensure that she's addressing those issues. But I don't think it's the job of a superintendent to you know, come up with educational solutions and that's, that's why you have a superintendent to make those types of decisions. Uh, as a person who understands budgets though, I know that if you have an area where you need funding and you are operating in a deficit so you have a limited amount of funding, I know how to uh, make sure that everything is running so efficiently and that we are considering opportunity cost of our expenses to make sure that the resources we have are being used in those high priority areas. And that's kind of how I feel I can contribute to that effort without actually controlling that effort, if you will. Are you comfortable with the school grading system as it exists now? No, not at state? all. How would you recommend the state adjust that? I don't necessarily have recommendations of how the state would grade an entire school with one grade. I don't think it's effective at all to do that. To say that this entire school is an A or this entire school is an F it doesn't really tell a parent much. That parent could go into that school and find the right teacher for their student, and that would be an A relationship for that student. You know, there are lower performing students, and here in Collier County, we have areas where we have very low performing students because of perhaps their socioeconomic status, how they're coming in, the language barriers, et cetera. That's low performing according to this somewhat artificial line that's drawn. And we need our teachers to be able to decide, you know, how can I help this student succeed? It may not be to score well on a test. It may be other areas. And I feel there's way too much emphasis on the test performance and not enough emphasis on allowing teachers who, as professionals, to decide what is the best way to move this student forward. Right now, the only way that they can move the student forward, at least according to the state, is by making them get a higher test score. And I feel that that's very short-sighted. Did you mention how long you've been in Collier County? You've been 12 years. 12 years. In the 12 years that you've been here, have there been uh, board members that you think have done an exceptional job that you would like to emulate? As far as emulating a board member that does an exceptional job, that's a tough question to answer. I mean, I don't see anyone necessarily like me on the board now or in the previous board. I, I think that I have balance as far as speaking out tactfully and being able to work with other people as well, but at the same time knowing who I work for as far as representing the citizens, the parents, the teachers of Collier County. I haven't seen someone with that level of balance. I've seen people who speak out a lot and maybe too much and don't want to work with each other, and I've seen people who don't speak out enough and don't really have that uh, citizen servant mentality where I know that I represent a certain constituency and I need to make sure that their voice is heard here on the board. So I could certainly pick out great things about certain board members in different areas, but those are the balance of the two I think is what I can bring. You talked about communication being one way earlier uh, from from the school administration. Um, what would you suggest to make it a two-way communication? Well, the town halls that the superintendent holds are great, but not when the questions are pre-selected and pre-scripted. You know, ask, allowing the public to ask real questions and giving real answers is okay. I've asked questions in board meetings before and I've been told we'll talk about it later. And I said even, I am asking because I want a public answer. I want other people to hear the answer as well, not just me. And I think that's an issue that I have is that the debate is not happening in the public realm. It's happening behind closed doors. It's happening on conference calls. And it, we need to be able to have those levels of debate to ensure that the public has trust in the system. 
if you don't feel the superintendent is getting that two-way communication at the town halls, is, would you be advocating yourself as a board member going out to hold town halls? I definitely plan on doing town halls, absolutely. And I, I don't see how else you can hear from your constituents. If I'm going to represent their interests, I need to be able to hear about their interests. And certainly we could say, oh, you know, you can send me an email or you can call me, but I am from the grassroots uh, way of doing things, I guess. And having an event where people can come, hear other people's questions and know kind of what other people are thinking, hearing those answers and, and having their opportunity to ask questions. I don't think that there's really a replacement for that, that in-person contact. So I would certainly plan on having town halls and being at other events where I know parents are going to be there and being open to talking to them. You mentioned that one of the things that got you on this road towards candidacy was the after-school issue and how it was handled. Given where we are today, is it, does the school board have a role in modifying that or is what it is what it is and, and it's the superintendent's ball now? I believe that the school board definitely has a role in modifying that because they set the policy. The policy right now is pretty convoluted, it includes an RFQ and all of these implied policies within the RFQ, and I think that was just kind of a bunch of patches to try to make the issue go away. As a school board member, I am very concerned about mission creep, and that includes after school care, that includes cell tower leases, because there's someone in the district that's managing all of this. And that person is not contributing to the education of the students in the classroom during the school day. And so I feel that there is an opportunity cost to these, what I would call mission creep items. And I feel that we should stay focused on our mission. If we're doing that 100% and we're getting an A grade and everyone is happy with what we're doing in the classroom, maybe we can branch out and do other things. But if you're not focused on your mission, and that's applies for business and it applies here I think as well then you're allowing these other things to distract you and your staff it seems like you've got a, a fairly ambitious and uh, agenda for yourself are you gonna uh, be a full-time board member no I actually work full-time uh, as a CPA I do have an early schedule I get up very early in the morning and, and get to work and get off around the time the kids get out of school but I am extremely organized. I have been involved in the community in various capacities, uh, large capacities, doing multiple projects at a time, and have been extremely successful. In fact, the people who've worked with me in those capacities outside of my career are the ones who encourage me to run because they know that I can be effective, that I am organized, and that I get things done. You know, I don't waste any time. Very determined about my time and very organized about it. And I think I know what my specialties are like related to the budget. I know that that is my priority in, in getting through that budget during these four years. And so that's really where my time and my focus is going to be. I know how to prioritize things as well. So I think that if you have that kind of personality and level of, of determination and diligence that it's definitely doable. Uh, we're running short on time. Uh, if, uh, anybody have any final questions? Given that, do you have a, a, is there something we've not talked about that you wanted to bring up, or do you have a, a final message for voters? Well, I will say a lot of what's going on in education is also happening at the state level. And something we didn't talk about is my experience in working with the state level on education policy and, and groups around the state when it comes to high stakes testing, teacher evaluations, and Common Core. And I think that's a piece that's been missing on the school boards. The school board says, these are our responsibilities and that's only what we're gonna look at. The state does these things over here. And what we need is a link between the two. Using town halls and other things to educate constituents about the decisions that are being made at the state level and encouraging your constituents to do something about it as far as writing their legislators, calling them. So I think the link between what's going on in Tallahassee and what's going on at the district, you need someone who's going to uh, make that build that bridge and allow the constituents to get involved, not just at the district level, but at the state level as well. And I'd like to offer that as a school board member. So I hope that I can earn your support and your vote on August 26th.